ha. Thank you. Um, we call it ha. Let me just let me show you this. Ha is our breath. It's our breath of life, actually. And so what we're doing is we're first inhaling through the nose with our belly out. And what we are inhaling is whatever is good in nature around us uh, and things in nature um, that are that are uh, productive and that are positive. And then as we exhale through our mouth and putting our belly in, sucking our belly in kind of, we're going to exhale all the stress <coughs> and problems that we have or worries that we have today about this or that. And just kind of clear our mind um, from all this distraction so that we can really focus on what is being shared and what maybe uh, the universe wants you to, <laughs> to kind of uh, start thinking about today. So are we ready? We're going to do this four times. Hanumai Kapono, breathe in what is good. Hanuaku inamea pono ole. Breathe out what is not good. Hanumai kapono. Hanuaku inamea pono ole. Hanumai kapono. Hanuaku inamea pono ole. Hanumai kapono. Hanuaku inamea pono ole. I'm not going to get into the detail of the value of that, but I highly recommend it. Next, I would like to greet everybody from the very highest deity or being that you acknowledge all the way down to the multitudes, which includes every living being within the sound of my voice. And that can be the plants. I have a light tea tree right out of my outside of my window going off and there's these light cheese are smiling at me and I have birds flying around. All those are included in my greeting to the multitudes. Aloha 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 na makua, aloha kale hule, aloha My next chant is a chant to center myself, but also for you folks to center yourself. And it's done three times. So if you can kind of listen the first time and then try the second and third time to chant along, that invitation is open to you. Each time we repeat, we go a semitone higher. <speaking in Spanish> Una me a una no e o my e o my e Eh, oh, my. 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 Eh, oh Thank you. And now we are ready to start. Aloha mai kako o ku hina hina ku i kahakai kahakalao ko u inoa. O honolulu ku u o neha nao. O makua ku u kai. 
o Hawaii, ku umokupuni, o Kilauea, ku ulua pele, o Waipio, ku uavava, o Hiilave, ku uvailele, o Wailoa, ku ukahapai. O kukui haile, ku ukulana kauhale. So if you could please, in the chat, let us know your name, and if it, unless it's already there, and two or more places that have shaped you into who you are today. So I shared with you my first place, my mountain, my river, my valley, my my a waterfall because these are all things that have shaped me to who i am today and that's why i shared them with you so if you can think of one or two places it could be a birthplace but it could also be you know um a, a hill that you live next to or a, a desert that that you are uh, live in whatever it is whatever place that has shaped you we're going to talk a lot about place-based education today so if in the chat you could please put uh, your name and a place or one or two three places that have shaped you kalamai sorry into who you are today the next part of my introduction is a little bit about my genealogy because that is also very very important O Daniela Kikino Kahakala o Kikane o Piao o Pupele Kavahine no Hopulawa Hana o William Kiahonui Kahakalao. O William Kiahonui Kahakalao Kikane o Irene Do Kawahine no Hopulawa Hana o Robert Kahakalao. O Robert Kahakalao Kikane o Frida Schmidt Kavahine no Hopulawa Hana o Kuhina Hina Kui Kahakai Kahakalao o Vaunu Ia Aloha Mai. By sharing a little bit about my ancestry, I am I am connecting myself and those who have influenced me. Um, and I also acknowledge their importance in my life. Um, here you see my, my mom, who is pure German, and my dad, who is Hawaiian. And um, then I also have two daughters and three grandchildren with one more on the way. And that is my family, that the, 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 the small part of the family. Obviously, we come from extended families, but just to show, and then there's also my siblings are in this picture and their and some of their family. So um just to let you know kind of um who I am based on the people that surround me and that shape me and that love me. <laughs> More or less, sometimes you know, siblings no, I'm just joking. Um, and then I also want to acknowledge that I would not be here without my mentors. These are just two of many, many mentors that have helped me to learn and continue to help me to learn. Um, on the left hand is Pualani Kanako Ole Kanahele, who is a renowned cultural expert and, and spiritual guide for us here in Hawaii. And on the right, you see Kukuna Catherine Mauna Kea, who was part of the last generation of native language speakers, uh, but also in, an expert in herbal medicines and all kinds of other uh, cultural practices. So I want us to do our first breakout room. Now we are, we are a relatively small group, so that'll work fine with about three people. And in that breakout room, um, I'm not too sure how that's gonna work. We didn't think about that as far as the Spanish and English. But let's just try and see if it works. Um, and I don't know if if the people that are uh, Andrea, if you're able to put them into a, a Spanish breakout room, perhaps or not. Um, but yes. if you could just share in the breakout room once we set it up, how you have been influenced by your ancestors, the elders, and your family. Okay. Three minutes, right? Cool. Yeah. Okay. Just very short. Influence. How were you influenced by your ancestors, your elders, and your family? Okay. Just a minute. 
Okay, breakout rooms are done. Yeah. There you can enter to the breakout room. Come back in three minutes with that question. Cool, I add you also to a breakout. Thank you, yes. Okay, Bye. Scarlett? Scarlett? Estás ahí? Hola, hey Vanessa. You're muted. Hi. I ended up in a room by myself, so I came oh, back. No. Okay, okay. I can Hi. help you. Let <laughs> me put you, which one is the room? Oh, yes, yeah, someone can stay here. Okay, I'll put you in room four. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Gabriela, hola. Hey, Gabriela. Can you hear me? Hola. Hola, ¿qué tal? Eh, ¿tú hablas, hablas de español, inglés? También, sí. Ah, ya, yeah. ok. Solo para tenerte en cuenta si es que hacemos más breakout rooms. <laughs> ya, sí, me, me metí igual recién en la, en la charla. Eh, así que estaba recién como ubicándome. Ah, ok. Ya. Sí. Yeah. ya viene la gente, entonces ya ahí te vas a ubicar. <ríe> ¿Qué es esto? ¿Cómo we do this <laughs> tan rápido? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Did that work for everybody? So it's the first one. We'll we'll, we'll get better. <laughs> the, and not you, Andrea Calabay. Um, so um, so we had a little bit of chance to discuss and and to realize that some way or another we are influenced by our ancestors. We are influenced by those around us, and hopefully you have um, the the privilege to be around elders. Um, if you can, that's one of my uh suggestions is you know as much as possible spend time with them and then obviously on also your family whether it's blood or other other kind of relations so within my talk today i will be talking a lot and i will be referring a lot to what we call olelo no eao which are hawaiian proverbs or poetical sayings and we were very fortunate that we have lots of them in hawaiian Okay, slow down. Is that what you think, Joao? Yeah. All right. We have lots of proverbs in Hawaiian that are passed down word for word from generation to generation. And they tell us about the values and the philosophy of our ancestors. And they guide us, just like they have in the past, they guide us today to and show us how we are supposed to behave. So they're not just there to have for the past, but they're here also to help us determine modern approaches to life 
and modern approaches to solving all of the things, uh, the issues that we're facing, um, and also the plans we have to go into the future. And ultimately, for me, these proverbs have revealed that ancient is modern, which is a part of our talk today, right? The focus of the talk is that what worked for our ancestors still works for us today. We were very fortunate that this beautiful lady here collected over 3,000 of these proverbs, um, which reflect ancient wisdom and which we are using today to validate and to justify why we are using Hawaiian knowledge and traditions to shape 21st century education. And that's the instruction, the curriculum, and the assessment, right? So our whole pedagogy of aloha is based on ancient wisdom. We don't need nothing from Stanford and from Yale and from Harvard or whatever. I mean, it's fine what they're doing because all they're doing is validating what our proverbs have already said thousands of years ago. So it's not that they're wrong, but... The thing is, if we look to our ancient wisdom, which in our case is in our Proverbs, um, and, and in other places too, but specifically easy codified in our Proverbs, then we will see that these practices align with the latest slash greatest in 21st century education. One of these Proverbs says, Aohe pauka ike okahi. Not all knowledge is contained in one school. And that concept that there are diverse sources of learning. So the teacher and the textbook are not just it, right? <laughs> now we have obviously uh, whatever technology provides, you know, but there's so many more sources of learning besides that. Another one of these proverbs says, Lehu lehu a mano mano kai kena akahawai. Great and numerous is the knowledge of the Hawaiians. We uh, were quote unquote discovered <laughs> and obviously not somebody uh, just so happened stumbled upon us in 1778. And since then, in one way or another, those who came from the outside have made us feel like we know less than them, that we are less than them. And then our knowledge is A, not significant, period, but certainly not useful in this modern age. So um, that's obviously not true because our ancestors knew that our knowledge is great and numerous. And actually the words lehu lehu and mano mano, which are number words, um, when you add them up, it comes into the billions. It says our knowledge is billions, you know, so... Just huge, humongous. So let's look at how our ancestors educated. And so I'm looking at that from the year zero when our when the first uh, Polynesians arrived in Hawaii on our double hulled canoes, and then till about uh, 1778, 1800. So th those about 2000 years because the year zero, we're not too sure it could have been earlier as well. That education was culture-based. It was informal. It was personalized. It was relevant. It was place-based, which we call Aina-based. It was project-based. It was values-based. And it was rigorous as demonstrated what we call Ho'ike, which is performance-based assessment to an authentic audience. And we'll talk about all of these things much more because when you look at these words and you are in education, you should realize that these are all buzzwords, right, in 21st century education today. So traditional learning was basically watching and, and mimicking, right? So here you see my husband standing in the front of his students and they mimic him. Um, it was working, it, it was learning together as these kids are doing right here, again, watching one another and learning from one another. Traditional education was about visual learning. Observe with the eyes, 
listen with the ears and shut the mouth, which is a really good one, and only until it has been explained. It's not that we don't want our students to ask questions, but first, listen to what I have to say, watch what I'm showing you, and then if you have questions, then you can answer, then you can ask those questions. So here we look at that, and, and when you look at these are two of my grandchildren, it's still like that, right? They look and they learn. That idea of visual learning, very, very high priority in traditional education. Another one is what we call hands-on or inductive learning, where uh, we practice, we do it, and then we look at the theory. And then... <clears throat> We derive the rules and principles from these experiences, from the things we have just already done. Excuse me. Makahana ka ike, in working one learns, is one of our proverbs, right? So by doing, we learn. Um, and by experimenting and by figuring it out, that's one way that we learn. And so hands-on learning, right, is, is what it was that, what we call that. Um, and that has been fa found to stimulate creativity and innovation, critical thinking and problem solving, communication and collaboration, all skills highly valued in the workplace today, right? These are all things that I, as an employer, would love to see from all of my employees, all of these things, right? I don't always, but I wish I would. The other thing is just the authenticity of it. Our ancestors said, e kanui kahuli o haule kaua, plant the taro stock while there, there is rain. So when, when there is the opportunity to do something, then we do it. We don't just do it because the teacher says, do it, we do it because there's a reason for doing it, right? So here on the right-hand side, they're harvested a taro, and now he's learning how to, to chop off the part of the taro that then will become the next generation. Um, in the center here, they are looking at um, species that came out of their, their net um, as they were studying what lives in this specific river. And on the right hand side, you have a young man. Now, sewing is not his favorite activity. I can tell you that right now. But he has to make his attire for his hula drama, which we will talk about. And you see how concentrated he is because this is his opportunity. He has only one opportunity to make himself good look, look good by creating an awesome attire. And so he's very, very focused on his task at hand. So according to our Elimakua, um, Sam Ka'ai, who is one of our cultural leaders, he is the one in the center there with the white lay. Um, Hawaiian education is about what is already within the students. So it's really about ancestrally guided learning, right? So acknowledging that there is ancestral knowledge within us and that it can come out. <laughs> and the more we practice, the easier it is to come out, the easier it is for us to connect with this ancestral knowledge and advance that ancestral knowledge. All right, so just right now, how is the session so far? Can I get an, uh, a thumbs up, thumbs down? Are we good? Are everybody good? Let me double check everybody else here. All right, Mike, I, I just want to make sure if I'm not going down the wrong direction here. All right, so... Now, let's talk about what did this traditional Hawaiian education result in, right? W what was the outcome of this type of education that I just shared with you? Well, it resulted in a thriving, self-sufficient society on each island because when the first white people ca came, they were just absolutely blown away by the exceptional general health and welfare, by the abundance of food and water and happiness. They write about that in their journals, especially the Germans. Um, they write about this in their journals that wherever they went, people laughed. They 
They saw people laughing with each other, at each other in a good natured, teasing way. This is this indigenous humor that many of you are familiar with, right? Teasing one another, but laughter all the time. Wherever he went, this one guy, Adelbert von Chamiso, he was a French Prussian aristocrat. Um, wherever he went, he heard laughter. And he was just blown away because in Europe, people wasn't laughing at that time. This is 1778. You know, the average people were just had a very, very miserable life. Um, the other thing that this traditional education resulted in was 100% sustainability and independence. We are 2,000 miles away from the next land in any direction. So we're we're the most isolated group of people in the whole world, which has has its good parts also in some cases. And we were 100% sustainable and independent with almost the same amount of people. One of the high estimate of how many people were in Hawaii at the time of contact is one mil is one million people. So in 1778 we have about one million people, and we. All, we grow all of our own food and we have lots of it, not just we barely making it, we have lots of food. We have an ancestral connection to the land. We take care of the environment together. Our land use practices are highly developed. We protect our resources. We propagate and fish expertly so that we don't deplete our resources and we share. There's no money involved in, in with these one million people we share and it's not trading it's sharing with one another i bring whatever i have and when you leave i give you something you bring whatever you have and if i go to your house you give me something it was that kind of thing today over 90 percent of our food comes from the outside over 90 percent of our food so going from one million people and 100% sustainable to about 1.5 million and 10% at the very most sustainable within 250 years. We also had flourishing artistic practices. These early explorers talk about our feather work being the most beautiful artwork they had ever seen anywhere in the world. So our utilitarian, we don't have a word for art, but all of our utilitarian objects, you know, our top of beaters, uh, where we make uh, cloth from, our bowls, whatever it was, it was all art. The way we made our lace or garlands, the way we worked with feathers. And you see these two uh, chiefs on the side there, they're both wearing um, feather capes, or one wearing a feather cape and a feather hat, and the other one has a feather lay and also a standard, uh, what she holds in her hand, like a little fan that's made out of feathers. Our carving, our dancing, our surfing, all of that was at a level of art. Our language, we didn't have a written language, but our oral language was highly sophisticated. Our ancestors had superlative oratory skills. We didn't just say regular words, we, we created poetry on the spot. Uh, when we talk to people, it was it was through chants and it was through poetry, um, using the nature as a metaphor, integrating these proverbs that I've been sharing with you, often having multiple meanings, including hidden meanings. We love to riddle and guess, make mind games with one another to see who is wittier. Um, and compared to others, that generally only chant with a spiritual world, we also chanted to the environment and we also chanted to people, which we still do. So instead of talking to one another, we would chant to one another. So if I came to your house, I did a chant for permission to enter, and then you chanted back and gave me permission to enter. And these were all done on the spot, again, using uh, metaphors uh, that, that incorporated nature or had hidden meanings, and that was all done on the spot. Once we um, were discovered, again, what, what, once we had uh, Western contact, um, shortly uh, thereafter, the first American missionaries arrived and introduced literacy 
um, to, to the Hawaiian people. They come in 1820, and by 1893, it was actually earlier already, but definitely by that time, and that the reason I'm using that date is that that's when we were invaded by the United States and have been uh, occupied by them ever since. Um, we had one of the highest literary rates in the world, only equal to um, Scotland and um, East, what is that up there? Um, New England, New England and Scotland and Hawaii. Those were the top three literate nations in the world. We still have millions of pages written in Hawaiian and the largest collection of indigenous writings worldwide. So once Western knowledge was introduced, we also excelled at that knowledge. And then in 1893, as I said, um, the American troops invaded our country. And since then, we have experienced overt Americanization, denationalization, colonization, whatever you want to call it. And so we have lost not only our sovereignty, but our language, which was outlawed when we, when we became colonized. Um, we have lost our land. Um, the, the federal government owned lots and lots of Hawaiian land. Uh, we've lost our cultural pride, our self-identity, our cultural identity, our self-esteem. Many of us have lost hope and many of us have, uh, have lost, not so much lost our intellectual learning ability, but uh, felt like we have lost it. Right, we, we still have it, but it doesn't feel like it, is what I'm trying to say. And so it was particularly through this uh, document, which was uh, a program for patriotic exercises that was published in 1906, and that every public and private school in Hawaii needed to adhere to if they wanted to be accredited. And so every morning, our kids had to salute like this Hitler kind salute, to the American flag, which we had no relation to, no anything, right? And salute that flag and say one country, one language, you know, one flag, you know, when this was not our flag, it was not our country, it was not our language. From one day of from 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 one day to the next, instead of learning about our own place and our own values and our own way of life and our songs and chants, we had to sing Yankee Doodle Dandy songs and find out, you know, about uh, the, you know, in the Constitution of the United States and quote all of those things and whatever special dates in American history. The whole curriculum was completely U.S. continental and our kids learned nothing nothing because this was the only thing that that they could that could be taught about ourselves from one day to the next and this is my grandfather's generation he was born in 1893 so he's in in elementary school he gets beaten for speaking the language with his friend on the playground so it was a really really horrible time for our people luckily after you know 70 years of of forced indoctrination. We have a Hawaiian Renaissance that aligns with the civil rights movement, that aligns with the American Indian movement around, it's all happening around the same time. And it starts with one of our sailing, with, with a sailing canoe that was built according to traditional specifications, sailing over 2000 miles from Hawaii to Tahiti without any modern instruments, just traditional knowledge, wayfinding knowledge, stars, currents, birds, winds, and that. And then nobody could say that Hawaiians were stupid anymore because stupid people cannot sail 2,000 plus miles against the wind to find a tiny speck in this huge Pacific Ocean, which is, you know, a third of the world's surface kind of thing. And then we, we started to fight for our land. We started to revive our traditional arts again, our chant and our dances, our language, our ancient martial arts, our herbal medicine, our rituals and our protocol, and also our traditional ways of education. Um, in 1843, one of our kings said, Ua mau ke ea o ka aina i ka pono. 
the life of the land is perpetuated in righteousness. Meaning as long as we do the right thing, and for us from 76 on for sure, it was going back to our traditional ways. If we did that, we would also eventually be free. We would also eventually be um, again politically able to make our own decisions. Um, so by that time, this is in 1983, is the first time that anybody is looking at the educational status of Hawaiians. And what 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 they find out is that we're suffering from historic trauma and family stress, that we score the lowest on all positive education performance indicators and the highest on all the negative ones. And because we have such poor educational outcomes, right, achievement, we then make less money and therefore are poorer than everybody else. We also, this report also uh, states that Hawaiian children are disproportionately victimized by child abuse and neglect um, and overrepresented in special education programs. We are disproportionately absent from school and we have lots of health problems. So this is a hundred years after the overthrow uh, of, of being, uh, or two, and 200 years from being this thriving people, right? And now we are on the bottom of, of every st bad statistic, uh, of every statistic in our homeland. And as you see up here, I put equals 2023. The truth is that nothing has changed when it comes to these statistics in the last 40 years but we're working on it. Uh, we have, as a group, as a large group, we are still in the same situation. However, smaller groups of Hawaiians are, are doing better because of our Hawaiian focused education. So why do we need it? Well, I think the previous slide pretty much showed it. In addition, we feel that we have a responsibility. We have a responsibility to our land, our culture, our values, our language, our way of life, our ancestors, our children, grandchildren, and seven generations or 10 generations or 100 generations into the future. But since the United Declaration on the Right of, Indi the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples was passed in 19 or 97, um, or uh, begun to, to um, we also have a right to educate our children in a way that is more consistent with our culture and our values, because we know that our knowledge structure differs significantly from the Western system, and that this Western system has not worked for the vast majority of Native Hawaiians. And so just a little bit about myself. I started as a, a Hawaiian language teacher. We started doing summer camps and I did a school within a school. Then I did a charter school. Then we got, then we, we convinced 11 other schools to join us and create an alliance uh, of 12 schools on three islands. Then we started a, a, a center for higher learning to, to offer teacher licensing to these, uh, the teachers teaching at those 12 schools. Um, then we got accredited, a six-year accreditation from, um, if you folks are familiar with accreditation, this uh, specific one is the same group that accredits, uh, for example, Punahou, where President o Obama graduated from. So they accredited private, accredited private schools rather than publics, and even though the charter is a public school, we chose to go with a private school accreditation to get a higher status, and we got a six-year accreditation right the, on, from the very first time we were accredited. And we also uh, opened up our first building uh, for our school, which was a Platinum LEED certified building. In 2015, we joined the, AI, the Ecoversities Network in Portugal and have since been active. In 2017, we started a social enterprise because what we learned was no matter how great the education part is, is working, if we are dependent on their money, their funding, they have us 
where they want to have us, <laughs> uh, which means we cannot make the kind of decisions we want to and do the kind of programming we want to. And so we started a social enterprise, which has become the economic driver for AIA, which stands for Education with Aloha Ecoversity, which we launched in 2020, which is a, I'll talk about that in a second. All right. Um, during these 35 years, I've also been actively involved in action research, looking at the impact of Hawaiian-focused education on Native Hawaiians. And this was a, is, because a, is, it's still continuing, is a multi-island research project. It has involved over 10,000 Hawaiian learners of all ages and abilities, public, charter, private school students, multi-age community education, early childhood to graduate level. So all, you know, every every age group, um, my doctoral dissertation was, was has been, in, in, um, which is in Indigenous education. So I'm the first person to my knowledge that has a PhD in Indigenous education. So my doctoral dissertation is part of this research and also multiple publications that you can look up. And I've done over a thousand presentations worldwide about this research. And that's kind of what I'd like to share with you um, today, um, what, what that research has, has uh, produced. Um, I currently am the president of AI Ecoversity, uh, which I just uh, mentioned we started in 2020 during COVID. Not a, not a really uh, best start from that perspective, but there was an opportunity uh, on offering internships to young Hawaiians, and so we went for it. AI Ecoversity, AI standing for education with aloha, also meaning sovereignty in Hawaiian is a culturally driven post-secondary education and career training program. And what we wanna do is empower our youth ages 15 to 30 to reach their highest potential so that they can resolve the, the challenges that our people face in the 21st century. And we feel that that has to be done by reconnecting them to our native language, culture, and traditions. Um, so we've been sitting for a little while. Or, uh, let's just do a little bit of uh, hockey, what we call hockey kino. Um, head up and down, and we'll do it 10 times. Makau kau. Ekahi elua, 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 ekahi elua. All right, I think that was ten. Let's go this way back and forth. Ekahi elua, 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 ekahi elua. Waikai. And the last one, bring our um head in one direction and then um let's do that one first ten times ekahi elua we're holding it and up and ekahi elua and holding it ekahi elua holding it ekahi elua and holding it and one more time ekahi elua and holding it and the other side ekahi elua Ekahi elua, ekahi elua, ekahi elua, and ekahi elua. All right, yeah. So just a little bit, and we do that when we when we're with the students. We always engage them in that. All right, here we are. We're ready. Pedagogy of aloha. Um, not something that I can say I. I designed it, I developed it, I anything, right? It, that's not how it works. It was something that emerged into consciousness that was guided by the ancestors. So divine guidance, we believe in this divine ancestral guidance, but it just kind of happened. And one day we said, okay, let's think about what are these pieces that are working after just doing it, right? We, we didn't start with a formula, we just did whatever. And what are the, the pieces to it? So when we looked at the pieces, we realized, and meaning 
looking at the pieces was the data that we got from our students. This was really informed by our students. It, uh, my, my PhD was about a pedagogy of liberation. But when we asked the students, nobody mentioned liberation, but they all talked about aloha. And I'll talk about that in one moment. So the, the formula that has that emerged is relations. That has to be the first part, building relations, relevance, having a relevant curriculum, plus responsibility, because in the Western system, it's about learning for learning's sake, which makes no sense to us at all. For us, it's about whatever we learn, we have a responsibility to do something with that knowledge. And if we have those three things in that order, relations, relevance, and responsibility, we will automatically, automatically, my auntie goes like this, automatic, automatically experience that this way of education is rigorous. And if we're doing it correctly, it should also be fun. It must be fun. From a Hawaiian perspective, if it's not fun, we didn't do it right. The other thing is that in this pedagogy of Aloha, the learner is always at the center. And those of us who are involved in the educational process are there to support that learner. It's not about how much money I make or, or that I have vacation in the summer. That's why I became a teacher. No, the reason I became a teacher is to support my students at all costs and help them feel my aloha and help them to thrive. So now let's talk a little bit about this word aloha. So as I mentioned earlier, we are 2000 plus miles away from any place. And as a result, we were able to develop this concept of love, affection, compassion, care, you can read them all over here, into a little bit of a different level because prior to contact with the West, we had no other. There was no other. Like in every place else, over the river, up the mountain, down the river, uh, across the desert, over the, on the other side of the forest, wherever it may be, there was this other. And that other was always less than uh, somebody else, than themselves. They, whereas for Hawaiians, we only knew one another. And while we had, you know, fights and we had skirmishes and wars between the islands and between the chiefs and all that, we acknowledged coming from a common ancestor. And I will tell you that story in a little while. So we were able to really take this concept of love and affection which is an important concept throughout the world right it's not like only hawaiians understand charity and and kindness and all of that however because we had no concept of other we really were able to take this aloha to another level and it's that aloha this idea of being loving and kind and compassionate and charitable and lovable that um, we have, that our students identified as the most important change agent. It was the students who told us, the reason I'm coming to school when I had 132 absences last year is because I feel somebody cares for me. My husband sometimes is the first man who tells like a 15, 16 year old boy, I love you. They have never heard a man tell them I love you before. And it's not just that my husband tells them I love you, but he shows them, right? His aloha for them. So this education with aloha, ea for short, which as I said, also interestingly means sovereignty, is really about engaging our students in a quality 21st century education. So as much as I'm talking ancient, much as I'm talking traditional, everything, I this, this is my, my youngest daughter, and you saw her from here, you see her from when she started in kindergarten. This is a kindergarten picture. And this is when she was pregnant. I don't know which child she's on number four now. But um, this is what I want for my own children. And this is also what I want for every other child that I touch and that my husband touch and that we as Hawaiian educators touch. It's a quality 21st century education that's congruent with our cultural values. And we believe that that will allow them to achieve success and success, not just not meaning I wanna be a billionaire or anything like that kind of success, but really 
where they feel uh, empowered and where they're happy. That's the most important part is the happiness part of it. Um, as I said, it was a high, an important quality in traditional Hawaii. It's still an important quality for us today. And so when we look at this pedagogy of aloha, we're looking at, uh, we're using the instructional aspect to build the relations where the curriculum is where we teach relevance and responsibility. And, and then the, in the, we use our assessment to make sure that it is both rigorous and fun. So our instructional approach is really about living aloha, demonstrating aloha, sharing aloha. And the first part, as I mentioned, starts with relation building. Now, when you're an educator and I talk about relationship building, most people will only think about the relations among the students, the relations between me and the students, maybe even the families, you know. But for us, it's not just building relations with the people involved in the process, but also with the environment and with the spiritual world. And we'll talk about each of those so the first one is the relations with the people, right? That's our first one. Uh, for us, we are very a very um, high touch culture, right? We we're always literally on top of each other, <laughs> um, hugging, kissing, all of that. Um, and and COVID was horrible, horrible for us because we we really suffered by not having that kind of high touch physical relation. And so the first thing, as far as the relation with people is concerned, that our ancestors recognize the value of a child, the value of each child. And they said, Helei poina ole kekeki. The child is a never forgotten lei. A lei is a garland like, like that I'm wearing here. And this was made for me. And it's a special lay. People usually explain where the plants that are in the lay came from, et cetera, et cetera. And just like that precious lay, so is a child. Um, the other proverb is aloha kikahi kikahi, love one another. So this is the directive. Remember, we talked about the, these proverbs being directives of our ancestors. So this is the directive of our ancestors. Verbatim, we need to love one another. And here you see a bunch of leis. So uh, my daughter, uh, this daughter is a is a traditional hula teacher, and this was when she graduated from the traditional hula school. Another one, another instruction about relationships from our ancestors is aloha mai no, aloha aku o kahuhu kamea eola oleai. When love is given, love should be returned. Anger is the thing that gives no life. And these, and we, you know, I mean, kids get angry, we get angry. And then when it happens, then we remind ourselves, hey, 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 let's slow down over here. Remember what the kupuna said? Aloha mai no, aloha aku, kahuhu kamea, e hola olei. There's absolutely no value in getting angry. It's not going to solve nothing. <laughs> and we talk to them about these things, right? We share these proverbs and we talk to them about these things. Another proverb, iki aku iki mai, koko aku koko mai, pela i hola kanohona ohana. The idea that family life requires an exchange of mutual help and recognition. And so for us, it's we operate as a learning family, a learning ohana, a, learn, a family of learners. And so we are required to help one another as part of our relation building. Waola loko iki aloha. You know, this a while back, they, they, meaning some smart, educated people on the continent, came up with this social emotional learning. Like, you know, they had just discovered the need and the importance of social emotional learning. This is a 2000 year old proverb, and it says exactly the same thing like, love is imperative. That's what it says in the book. I'm quoting imperative for our mental and physical welfare, right? So um, if we don't show this aloha to our students, to our learners, to everybody around us that we're working with and learning with, um, we are depriving them and we're impacting their mental and physical welfare. 
Sometimes, you know, we don't have, uh, we, we, as I said, we share, we bring gifts, we gift each other, right? Um, but sometimes we don't have a gift. Like we wasn't planning on visiting so and so, but, you know, we, somebody took us there, whatever, whatever. Then at least we can say a kind word or a friendly greeting, um, because that is just as important. And so many times in, in my 35 years of teaching, sometimes just seeing when a student has an issue and going there and saying, you know, um, can I, can I do something for you? Look, you look kind of down. Um, you want to talk about it? You know, I, w- I want to let you know that no matter what happens, you can always count on me helping you, whatever I can do for you. Just, just make sure you let me know. Um, just simple, simple things like that can sometimes even cause children to, to stop contemplating suicide. We've had that happen. So we, we really have to remind ourselves how important a friendly word can be. At our school also, and I'm not there anymore. Um, I was there for the first 10 years as an administrator, and I hated it. <laughs> so I got out of there as fast as I could. Um, but um, we use family terms. So I'm not Dr. Kahakalau there. I'm Auntie Cool. And here you see some of the aunties and some of the grandmas and some of the siblings uh, that sometimes are physical siblings, but sometimes are not related by blood, but still recognize each other as brother and sister. And so one of the parents told us that the students and staff aloha each other and work together as part of an extended family. All adults are referred to as uncle and auntie and care for the students like their own children. I feel truly blessed for my child to be part of this special ohana, which means family, where she feels welcome and loved. And this atmosphere of aloha, right? If we can create that kind of atmosphere, which we call atmosphere for aloha, you can call it atmosphere of love, kindness, compassion, is the most important part when it comes to working with our marginalized communities, but really with all children and all adults and and all people, but especially for our marginalized communities. And so, as I mentioned, we have a older sibling, younger sibling kind of a system. And I'll talk about that a little bit more in my story. Um, and, And that is really something that is an important aspect where we have lots of Uh, multi-age activities and also intergenerational activities and lots of opportunities for our students to work together and to collaborate because we are a collaboration and affiliation oriented people. We thrive when we work together. We have a really hard time working by ourselves. And it's coined in our proverb, pupu kahi holomua, united we progress. So it's not just something we love, but it's also something that works very, very well for us. So multi-age peer teaching and peer learning, which happens all the time, allows our students to share their knowledge and skills in non-competitive settings, right? They're, they're teaching uh, and they're learning at the same time. This, this young man that is that is teaching to to these little kids right here. You know, he had a really, really hard time reading at his grade level. I think in this year is about maybe fourth grade. And he was only at, at first grade, which is what these kids are here. So we gave him a first grade book and we had him reading to the first graders. And then within a very short time, his reading level increased because he was practicing. And so we, uh, we, we uh, provide lots of opportunities also for group uh, success. We, we we create settings and assignments that foster group effort and group achievement, and and we make sure that the students understand that it's more important that we all move together and progress collectively rather than if I make it and all you other guys don't. That's not a Hawaiian way of thinking, but that's how the Western system is set up. Right? It's strictly about individual achievement. We involve our families as much as possible in and out of the classroom. We also involve our elders and cultural and community experts in and out of the classroom as much as possible because there's so much knowledge within these groups of elders and cultural experts. 
and we reframe or frame the teacher as a co-learner. So this idea of the sage on the stage lecturing and sharing his infinite wisdom with all these stupid little kids, you know, that, that concept or that tabula rasa, right? Uh, you know, with this blank slate um, is not our way of teaching and learning. Our students are involved and they participate and they learn as they teach. In Hawaiian, we have only one word for teaching and learning, and it depends on what the directional is that is attached to it. So aku means a way. Ao aku is to 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 that that that, that um, transfer of knowledge going away from the speaker. Ao mai is the transfer of knowledge towards the speaker. Ao aku ao mai. It happens. Both of them happen at the same time, while you are aku, you are omai. And while you are omai, then the next thing is gonna be, you're gonna ao aku and share that learning. So by um, doing authentic projects, the, the teacher becomes a co-learner. And we make a special emphasis on making sure that we build familiar re relationships uh, where the students get to know one another, the students get to know you as the teacher, you as the teacher get to know the students and their families, and their families get to know you. That is so important um, to build relations that we can then build on uh, when it comes to the academic part. And this has to happen first. If your students don't know you, uh, then they probably don't even like you either, right? And then it's not gonna happen. So the way they get to know we get to know one another is by knowing where we come from, by knowing our each other's genealogies, by knowing each other's personal histories or stories, by knowing each other's preferences. So uh, in our, my husband, for example, he can tell you exactly which student is very kinesthetic, where they have, they, they want to move their body and do stuff, which ones are really visual and they love to draw and others that are orally, uh, that's their preference, and they rather do an oral exam than a written exam. And he knows that about each one of his students, what are their gifts, what are their talents, because we believe that all of our children are gifted and talented, what are their passions. Then when we find out, uh, like this little girl here, she wanted to learn how to throw net, so then we personalize this education and we teach them one-on-one -on -one how to, in this case, throw net and catch fish. Another thing for us that's really important is to know the names of our students, particularly their Hawaiian names. So this is my name, Hina Hina Kui Kahakai, which is the name of this plant that you make these lays out of. It means gray ones standing at the beach. So one thing, just by knowing my name is, you will know that I love the beach, that I love the ocean. I love to be there rather than in the mountains, for example. And so learning about their names and learning how the names are shaping them, because that's also a part of what shapes us into who we are, is also really important for us. All right, so let's go back into another breakout session now and just share one thing. Uh, it's a two minute breakout of something that surprised you or just kind of, uh, you know, just kind of noted, made, you know, was like, huh? or whatever, something that, that you didn't expect to hear or see or something that, that you really liked. Just a little conversation about uh, our, our presentation so far. Hey, um, Andrea, are you still with us? Doesn't look like it. Okay. All right. Then we That's can. Cool. We had to switch. It's Sierra now. Oh, okay. So uh, can you do a breakout session or should we move on? Yep, for sure. 
Okay, so two minutes, three people per session. Great. Please, thank you. Yeah, sorry, we just had a moment where we had to switch over. So by now you should all have had lots of time to think about your answer. <laughs> Uh, three people in each group. Yeah. Three people in a group, two minutes, please. Okay. Groups are open. Hola, Vera, ¿cómo estás? Hola, Andrea. Sabes que están en breakout rooms, ya vuelven en dos minutos. Sí, muchas gracias. ¿Quieres que te junte o esperas dos minutitos? No, solo espero porque estoy llegando muy tarde. ¿eh? Es como uh -huh. solo para estar un poquito y dar mi apoyo, apoyo a Q. Se vería mismo bien en un minutito. Me voy a quitar la, la misión, ¿no? Dale, tranquilo. Sarai, ¿estás ahí, Sarai? Sarai, uh, Andrea, by the way, oh, nothing, nothing. Before I come back, it's okay. It's okay. All right, let's see if we're back. Are we back? No, just like, uh, let's wait for 30 seconds. People are coming back. Yeah, all right. Okay. Um, 13 seconds more. <laughs> there is everyone coming back. Yeah. All right. Yeah, now we are. Wonderful. Thank you. I hope you had some um, good discussions in that very short time. Um, our next section is about building relations with the environment. As I said, for many people, in, when you look at education, they just think about, you know, we have to make sure that the relations among all the people involved in the process are amicable. But for us, it's also about the environment. So I shared with you folks some of my places, and it was this this right, I mean, the left-hand side is my ocean. And the reason I picked this as my ocean is because this is where I learned to survive off the ocean. Um, I know where every single hole is and what fish, fish type of fish lives in that hole. I know how to lay my net across the beach so that when I get up in the morning, it is full of fish. I know how to find the squid on the sand. Um, this is my ocean, <laughs> if you know what I mean. The second picture is my volcano. My great grandmother's name uh, means the, um, the stomach of Pele or the stomach of the volcano, which means our families were able to sense 
um, volcanic eruptions. This is the goddess that is my goddess, my personal goddess that I wor worship, if you want to look at it that way. And so that is my volcano. And then on the right hand, you see my valley. <laughs> That's my valley, not because I own it. I don't own any of it, but this is where I spent the last 35 years or something um, raising my children, born and raised in this valley, and figuring out how to do Hawaiian-focused education. This is the place where I learn how to feed myself from the land um, and where I get inspired. I'm a songwriter, and all of my songs pretty much are about this valley because it's my inspiration. So you see how when I'm talking about relations with the environment, at what level of relation I'm talking about here. And so I want to tell you a Hawaiian story. It's like cosmogonic genealogy means how we are related to the environment. And I'm going to do it in Hawaiian. And I would like to invite you to uh, this a phrase that comes over and over. And once you figure it out, just kind of say it along. And so this is Kamolelo of Papa Mewakea, this cosmogonic gen genealogy of Papa and Wakea. Papa being sort of the earth mother and Wakea being the sky father. That's not the exact translation, but that's kind of the closest we, we get to. So Papa and Wakea meet, they introduce each other. And the priest notice that they come from the same family tree, which in our case means they have lots of uh, spiritual power. Can we say that together? Okay. Uh, you can uh, keep the keep the microphone off uh, because we're going to be saying it. But when I say it, when you see it coming up, then you say it as well. So uh, Papa comes to Wakea one day and she says, Wakea, I'm pregnant. Lau Lau is a is a food for us that we where we wrap fish and and pork sometimes or chicken into taro leaves and then tea leaves. And so it's this wrapping because our people believe that that a pregnant woman is like has. It's like the wrapper to the child within her. So let's say it one more time. Eva kea ua lau lau. So she's pregnant, and as you can see, Wakea is ecstatic. Aha now o Hawaii hemoku. So the island of Hawaii is born. And Papa comes again, and what does she say? Ewa kea ua lau lau. And Hanau Kamoku, Hanau o Maui Hemoku, the island of Maui is born. And once again, everybody, Ewa Kea, Ua Lau Lau. And Hanau o Molokai Hemoku, the island of Molokai is born. Everybody, Ewa Kea, Ua Lau Lau. Hanau Lanai Kaula Hemoku, the island of Lanai is born. Everybody, Ewa Kea. Ua lau lau. Hana o Oahu Hemoku, the island of Oahu is born. And again, Ewa Kea, Ua lau lau. Hana o Kawai Hemoku, the island of Kawai is born. Again, Ewa Kea, Ua lau lau. Hana o Nihau Hemoku. And again, Ewa Kea, Ua lau lau. He ula o kaho olave. And kaho olave is the afterbirth. Alela, ha alele o wakea ya papa a huipu oya me ho oho kukalani. Olele mo e oh aloha e ho oho kukalani. Velina e wakea. So wakea leaves papa and he meets ho oho kukalani and he tells her greetings ho oho kukalani. And she says greetings wakea. And they live together and guess what happens? Everybody, ewa kea, ua lau lau. So now ho kukalani is, uh, is pregnant. And again, ewa kea is super excited. Ooh, great, awesome. Ah, awe. He keiki alu alu. Ua hala ku ihiapo we mai o ho kukalani. Unfortunately, the baby is unshaped. Um, so... 
and passes away. And so uh, Ho'ohoku Kalani is distraught because her, both of them are because her oldest child has passed away. Aka ikalae olelo mai o wakia e nana mai he kalo o halo anaka lau kapalili kona inoa. The next day they go to that place where they buried their child, and wakia says, "Look, it's a taro. His name shall be halo anaka lau kapalili." Alela hele ho o. Um, Ho'ohoku Kalani, and what does Ho'ohoku Kalani tell Wakea? E Wakea, ua lau lau. Ah, ha nau mai oia he keiki kane he keiki i kaika, o ha loa kona inoa. And she gives birth to a healthy boy, and they name him after his older sibling, ha loa. So what we have is that from the beginning of time, our islands, our taro and us as the Hawaiians are one family. The islands and the taro are our older siblings and we are the younger siblings. And remember when I talked about the relationship, right? Older sibling, younger sibling. So the older sibling is in charge of taking care of the younger sibling. And then the younger sibling is in charge of serving the older sibling and that is what we call aloha aina or love for the land and the environment and the things within nature and that comes out of that story right so now let me tell you that same story in chant form So this is the type of chanting that our ancestors did, right? And this is the type of chanting that we want to revive. It's not that I'm running out of time and I said it really fast. And this is the way that uh, our like that that we that one way of chanting. So if you could in the chant in the chat, sorry, write one thing that you learned from this story, something that you learned from this story. If you could put that into the chat, that would be lovely. And I am checking the chats as we move along. So this relation with the land, which we call Aloha Aina, has been established through this cosmogonic genealogy since the beginning of time, right? We are the younger siblings to the land. So we have obviously a relation. And so we try to make that relation a way of life um, by involving our students in building that relation. Because you can't say you love your grandma if you never visit her, right? I mean, you can't say you love her, but it's not the same as if you live with your grandma and you help your grandma and you take her everywhere and you have this very close relationship with her. Uh, my daughter used to crawl into the bed with the, my grandma. My mother was in bed for many years um, uh, as she before she passed. And, and my daughter would crawl in there with, with her and they would watch movies together, you know? I mean, that kind of relation. And this is the same kind of thing with the land. You can't say, oh, I love the land <laughs> and never go out there and never do nothing on the land, right? Never be part of the land, never help the land. And so the way we build this relationship with the environment is what we call kilo, which literally means to watch closely, to spy, to examine, to look around, to observe and to forecast. And it was that practice that helped us to figure out, you know, how to sail without modern instruments over thousands and thousands of miles of open ocean and find very remote islands all over this huge Pacific. 
So one way we do that is by being out in the environment. Uh, the school, when I started, it was 50% in the classroom, 50% in an outdoor environment. And so the students were out there uh, either one week at a time um, and then went into the classroom or, you know, um, there were different formations, but in general, it's one, it was one week out in a, in a residential program or just going out and working outdoors and then another week indoors or any other way, but just making sure that 50% of their learning happened in the environment. And so there they learned about their places. They learned the names of their places, the stories and histories of their places, the chants and songs of their places the proverbs and expressions of their places, the elements. We have wind and rain names in some places, uh, like our valley here, YPO Valley. Um, we have like, you know, 20 wind and rain names, for example, just in this one little valley. Um, and also learned about the famous people of these places. And then the next uh, relationship that we are also building is our relation with the spiritual world, which we call Aloha Akua. Akua just meaning a deity or a, a spiritual power. And so that is a little tricky because uh, we were, or we, you know, the school is a public school and I work with public school teachers when I train. Um, however, <clears throat> when we keep it very vague and we use the word protocol, <laughs> then we get away with it. So it's basically we building relations with the spiritual world through protocol, which to us means doing the right thing at the right time for the right reason. And so our protocol is something that happens pretty much all the time. And um, it's something that is really, really important to us. And as I said, we don't call it prayer and ceremony. We just call it our protocol that allows us to get away with it. And so... We start and end our classes and activities with protocol. We greet and interact with our guests with protocol. Before we enter a house, a forest, or a sacred site, we do protocol. Before we plant, harvest, or eat, we do protocol. And before we interact with any of the elements in the spiritual world, we also do protocol. So that's something that is our way of life, is to do protocol. And that can mean different things. It could just be a chant. Uh, chanted or said, it could be giving offerings, it really depends. And then we also allow our students to participate in traditional uh, ceremonies. These are by invitation, meaning uh, it's not part of your grade because we want to respect everybody's uh, religious preferences and spiritual preferences. And so those who want to, and the, and the truth is right now, very many young people in Hawaii, I can certainly speak for Hawaii, I think it's the same also in the U.S., are affiliated with any kind of religious or spiritual traditions. You know, they, they, they don't go to church, they don't go to a temple, they don't, they don't, there's just nothing anymore. And so for many of them, they are very, very in need of and want to learn more. And so we offer those opportunities through traditional ceremonies, like this harvest ceremony that we do every year at the beginning and at the end of our winter season. All right, let's do a little bit more stretching. We're going to go this side first, five to 10 seconds. Uh, just, just kind of back and forth like that. Uh, just to get our arms up a little bit. One and a couple more times. Okay, and our Hawaii, the other side. Just back and forth, stretching that arm. Okay, and if you're on a chair, move back a little bit so you don't hit anything and just get your leg up. Keep it up three to four seconds and down and up again. Ekahi, elua, ekolu, eha, and down again. And up. Ekahi, elua, ekolu, eha, and down again. And one more time. Ekahi, elua, ekolu, eha. And the other leg. Up. Ekahi, elua, ekolu, eha. Down. Ekahi, elua, ekolu, eha. 
down. E kahi, e lua, e kolu, e ha, and down. And e kahi, e lua, e kolu, e ha, and down. And then we're going to go downwards. Just, just go, trying to touch our feet. Going down. E kahi, e lua, e kolu, e ha. And up. And down again. E kahi, e lua, e kolu, e ha. And up. And one more time. Um, by now you should be able to count in Hawaiian. <laughs> um, sometimes, you know, you just by using a language, um, even if people don't really understand it, they'll get it, right? People are smart and you, and they have common sense, so they should get it. All right. Our next, so this was about relation building now. Now let's segue into relevance. Remember the formula is relations plus relevance plus responsibility equals rigor plus fun. So relevance is about making, involving the students in a way of education that makes sense to them, right? That's interesting. And when it's interesting, then it should also be fun automatically. And so for us, what is relevant is us. <laughs> it's our islands, right? The continent is not relevant to us, right? Another part of the world is not relevant to us. What is relevant to us are our islands. So it's a very place-centric curriculum. Um, and this is my island, and this is the area of the island where I live is up there in the Northeast. And so my curriculum when i when i work with the students is about that place it's place centric and that goes for all content areas whether i'm teaching language arts or whether i'm teaching math whether i'm teaching pe or science or history it's about our place first and the important part is first right we start in the center with our place and then from there we go out in concentric circles and we can go all the way to the end of the world that's perfectly fine but we don't start out there, right? Which is what's happening now in the Western curriculum. They start with U.S. history. Who gives a rip about U.S. history? I mean, the people on the U.S. should. We are Hawaiians. That's not our history. So we want to start with our history. And then, you know, eventually we'll get there. We learn about that as well. But we will have something that first makes sense to us to compare and contrast it to. So all content areas start first in our place and then go outwards to wherever we needed to go. And our kupuna understood that importance of place-based learning. They said, The natives of the land declare the weather is calm when the tropic bird, which is this bird right here, travels afar. So they understood that we know our environment, and that's what we should be teaching is the things that we know. Also, only the mist knows the storm that causes the streams to swell. So we understand the issues in our communities, the issues of our place, whether they're environmental or social or political, because we live here, right? We see what's happening. We see um, when families are fighting. We see when uh, the, the road is, is washed out or whatever. You know what I mean? We know what's happening. And so again, ancient wisdom validating the importance of place what in addition to place the other things and this is the valley again i'm showing you different different uh, uh aspects of our valley and my waterfall here my water right it's the relation that i have because we our farm we have five acres that is right below here and we look into the waterfall so besides place it's also our culture but what is also relevant are contemporary real world issues, right? So if something is happening in the world that is important, like um, Harry Belafonte just passed away. My mom used to sing his songs to me and us as kids on her guitar as as we, uh, you know, to, to put us to sleep. Um, he was a huge activist, you know, in the civil rights movement. When something like that happens, that wasn't planned into the curriculum, but that is something then that our teachers will address and talk about his influence between music uh, and then his political activism and all those kind of things. So whenever something happens that is, is a real world 
thing, you know, we bring it into our curriculum because it is relevant. And then the other thing is whatever is of interest to the students, right? So if they're into Antarctica or if they're into robotics or if they're into whatever else, we also want to make sure that we that we integrate those things or we allow the students to do projects that integrate their personal interests. So for us, it's about relevance and about authenticity when it comes to the curriculum. Oh, I didn't notice I have this picture twice. That's all right. So learning and assessment in the context of completion of necessary tasks rather than learning and assessment for grades, right? Or just for learning sake. So when the students know that what they're doing makes sense, right? When it makes sense to them, then they perform better. And that's something that they told us themselves and that we see over and over again. And so when it comes to place-based education, the environment becomes our text. The environment becomes our inspiration. The environment becomes our teacher. And as we learn in the environment, we are also then positively impacting the environment. And we don't just go out there um, once in a while. We really have our students involved in ongoing authentic research in the environment as co-researchers to solve real world problems and issues in that environment. So, um, and I'll talk about this a little bit more in detail in a minute. And then we also bring in the elders and the community experts as resources uh, that know that environment. Remember that proverb that said, you know, as natives, we know our environment. So again, extensive time spent learning in and from the environment. 50% is minimum to me. Um, because the environment is such a powerful teacher. Another thing about the environment is that the environment is also a loving and caring teacher. It does not discriminate. It doesn't matter how tall you are or how skinny you are or how fat you are or how what is your IQ um, or you know um, what is your strength and all of those things. The environment loves you equally, loves all people equally. And when you make that relation with the environment and you show that environment that, that you care, it will return that care by producing beautiful food and flowers and everything that you need um, to, you know, for culture practices, for example. Um, so then also, rather than um, learning how to reflect on your experiences in the environment, doing that in the classroom, we have found that when we allow students to journal, and that could be writing or drawing in nature rather than in the classroom, it's just a whole different ballgame. The, the excellence of what they produce is just so much greater. And then uh, remember I talked about Kilo, that observation, right? Um, they have to every day, they have a place that they have to observe in the environment when they're out in the environment. And when they're at school, it's a place on campus and look at the clouds and look at the where the winds are coming from or where the rains are coming from and look how the ants are doing today or how the birds um, that are in that area, you know, if they're there or the fish or whatever it may be, the seaweed, uh, but really getting to learn that environment through daily observation, which we call Kilo. And so um, in 2003, we started a longitudinal stream study and we participated in that for 10 years. It was a historic research study that measured the, the uh, impact of 100% stream restoration on the native fauna and flora. Like many places in the world, our water was stolen from our valleys for the sugar companies and the pineapple companies um, to get rich, really, right? To feed their sugar plantation and their pineapple to plantations and get rich. And then when they weren't making large profits anymore, then they left and probably went to a place where you may be living now. Um, and we demanded that the water needs to come back. You stole it in the first place, it needs to come back. And so this was the first time that 100% of a native stream was restored to its native stream bed. And so our student, and so that had a statewide impact because the same thing happened, the theft happened everywhere. And we wanted to show how important it is that everything needs to come back, not just half of it or 80% or whatever. 
And so they worked with real scientists in the field every other week for over 10 weeks, 10 years, some of them from fifth grade to 12th grade, um, and collected and analyzed real authentic data using high tech equipment. And as they were doing that, they were exploring various green careers. Um, so like here you see the, there's supposed to be a waterfall, but there is no waterfall because the water was taken, right? And that was what, the, what prompted the lawsuit. And the lawsuit then prompted a settlement where the scientists had to help um, figure out the impact. And they asked us as a school to help with it. And so our students lived in this valley, like my daughters, from fifth grade to 12th grade from every other week. And my husband was the primary teacher. And this is what they were doing. This is their, was their, their, um, so it was, it had to do with looking at the quality of the streams, what, what species were in the streams, the temperature, the pH. So this is some high scientific kind of research that they're doing. Um, that first people said they couldn't do like a hydro lab like this. She's holding right here is like a thousand dollars. And they said, oh, middle school and Hawaiian students, they can't do that. And yet they did. And they did a fabulous job over many years. Not all of the students stayed as long as my students did. My children did, but many of them stayed multiple years in the project. So it was first not just a middle school project, but then when they didn't want to leave, we made it a middle and high school project. And guess what the outcome of those 10 years was? When the stream thrives, right? when the environment is restored, then the natives thrive. And the natives in this case being the gobies and being the, the seaweed and the uh, uh, crustaceans that live in the river, um, all of these species, the plants that live in the river or around the river, um, it was a it was a very uh, now that we have all of that data to validate that when we when we restore our environment to its native conditions that our natives which can be our animals our plants but also our people thrive again. Another thing that is that we incorporated in order to make our curriculum relevant was Hawaiian knowledge, you know, so starting from young on learning how to work with an ipu, which is a gourd, you know, learning how to sand the gourd and then eventually how to play the gourd, how to use the gourd as an instrument. Um, those are things that were that are being taught to our students from young on. Other things include plating and working with rocks, making uh, um, and with um, different kinds of plants, doing string figures, uh, dyeing with turmeric and other plants, making nettings, uh, decorating our gourds, all of those kind of uh, what we would consider traditional skills and functional arts is are things that our students are learning. They are also involved in traditional food production because, as I said. 90% um, of our food is imported, so we really have to work hard on getting uh, back to growing our own food. And this starts from very young on, from preschool on, all the way to the high school. Um, also learning how to prepare their food again in traditional ways, which is the underground oven, which you see up here in the center. Um, and gathering things like ferns and um, knowing how to cook the breadfruit, uh, knowing how to clean the fish that they caught and things like that. Also being involved in traditional sports and games. Um, every year we have competitions where the, uh, both on land and in water, we have ga games of skills and games of strength. First the word sport and game is the same word, so we don't differentiate there really. And so we learn, uh, uh, how to be physically fit and also have obviously lots of fun. In addition, our language and our culture, you know, is uh, in integrated in many different ways um, from learning some of our traditional dances um, to uh, how to eat our, our crabs straight out of the ocean. <laughs> we like to eat raw seafood um, and uh, uh, how to help sail a voyaging canoe. There's just some, some examples, some pictures to show you. Uh, chanting and dancing are really important for us uh, because that was a traditional form of communication. 
And so that's something that all of the students learn, and we'll talk about that a little bit more in a little while. Also playing more modern Hawaiian music, using modern instruments is something that our students love to do, and it's something that we encourage them to get involved in. Our, la our next section, um, so we talked about relevance, right? Creating curriculum that's relevant. That's something that makes sense to the students. Now we want to talk about responsibility, um, which, as I said, is not a normal thing that is taught in the Western education system. Responsibility to our learning, that we have to understand that what we're learning, the reason we're learning it is to make social impact, to make cultural impact, to make environmental impact, to make political impact. Um, we, that's our responsibility is to do something with that learning and something positive with it that doesn't only benefit us, but that benefits a greater uh, amount of people or the environment and to a certain extent, even the, the spiritual world as well. Um, yeah, I'll talk about this later. Um, so it's responsibility to ourselves. A lot of times, because of the historic trauma that we experienced, many of us don't feel like we have any responsibility to ourselves. And as a result, we, you know, do drugs and drink and uh, whatever, whatever. Um, and that's not good, you know. So our students have to learn from young on already that they have a kuleana, a responsibility to stay healthy. They have a responsibility to their family, to contribute and support their family, to their community to their nation, in this case, I'm talking about the Hawaiian nation, not the US, and to the global community and the earth, which we call Papaha Naumoku. That's the story, right, that I that I shared with you guys about Papa who gives birth to the islands. And so the Olala no Eau says, e malama i kokuliana, take care of your responsibility. And so for us, it's not just learning for learning's sake, but for a purpose to fulfill a responsibility. And so for us, it's about learning in the context of task completion rather than just, you know, for, you know, okay, so I learned something. Um, and that can include, you know, okay, you have, you, this is your area to weed, you know, this is your area to, the, to do this. And if we all take, maintain our areas, then we're going to be in top shape. Our ancestors, um, understood that not all children are equal in terms of when they are ready to learn a specific thing. So for us, it wasn't about reckoning a child by years, but by the ability to perform a task, to understand what the task was and to perform it efficiently. And so we have a bunch of proverbs that talk about that. Uh, the one for the the earliest that I could find was kanue paai ikahue vai, the size that enables one to carry a water bottle. Now you see, this is not a flask. This is a gourd that took a long time to grow and then to dry and then to clean, then to make the net that that gourd is in, the string you know, from strips of uh, bark, et cetera, et cetera. And only when a kid understood that how how long it took and how much labor and expertise it took to create this gourd, um, were they given the, the task to carry this gourd. Also, they had to be strong enough because once you fill it with water, it's it gets obviously heavier. The gourd itself is not too heavy. The net is light, but once you put the water in, it gets heavy. So. You could be about two years old, but if you're a little girl and not so, you know, strong, you might be three years old when this happens. The most important part was that when you understood what it took to make the water bottle and when you were strong enough to carry it, nobody gave you a certificate. Nobody gave you an A. Nobody gave you a star <laughs> somewhere, you know, kind of thing. What they gave you was a water bottle. And every single time that the family would go to the spring, from the time on that you were determined to be able to do that, you were given a full water bottle and you had to carry that all the way back to your house. So from as young as two years old, 
you, a two-year-old, were responsible to contribute to the health and welfare of your family because fresh water, we can, none of us can survive without fresh water. And sometimes when people lived, there were no springs there. So you had to walk in sometimes long distances to get fresh water from a spring. So imagine what kind of responsibility are we giving our two-year-olds today or our three-year-olds or our 10-year-olds or our 18-year-olds for that matter, right? We are not, and that is a huge disservice to them because how are they going to learn responsibility if they're not given responsibilities early on? And the second one is kanue pa'ai na niu elua, the size that enables one to carry two coconuts. She's only carrying one. They are about five years old when you can carry two coconuts like that. And again, same thing. Whenever the family would go wherever the coconuts were, when, once you were able to carry those two, you were given, and it wasn't an option to say, oh, today I don't think I'm going to carry one. No, <laughs> you were responsible to carry these two coconuts back to the house and, again, contribute to the health and welfare because, A, you would have the coconut water, you would have the husk for kindling, you'd have the, the shell to make cups, you would have, you know, the, 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 also the, the outside, the husk for to make rope. So there was all these benefits that you would, contribute so you were a breadwinner in so many ways a coconut water winner at the age of five already contributing to your family this is your older sibling younger sibling thing right when you were old enough to carry your younger sibling on your back that's what that was your responsibility and when you left in the morning with that sibling, you better come back in the evening with that sibling. And that sibling better not be crying, and that sibling better not be hungry, and that sibling better not be soiled or dirty or, or injured, even worse, right? That was your responsibility. At 10 years old, around there, or 12 years, or however old you were, depending on you and your younger sibling, you had full responsibility for a human being. Again. Think about if you're a parent or a teacher, how much responsibility are you giving your children or your teachers? I mean, sorry, your students, your children or your students. This is my favorite. When you're old enough to broil food, when you're old enough to make a fire with nothing but sticks, right? Rubbing it all, like basic kind gathering whatever food it is and whether it's a breadfruit that you have to get, get from the tree or a fish that you get from the ocean and then are able to broil it on a fire without a metal grill and all of that stuff without metal instruments to get it in and out of the water without aluminum foil or whatever whatever when you had that skill only then should you have sex because when you have sex there's always that potential of another being being conceived and if you can't even feed yourself and your mate, you sure as heck aren't ready to feed a baby, right? So again, the idea, responsibility and um, the, the things that you can engage in and do hand in hand. So the idea is really about collective responsibility, taking care of the people, taking care of the land, taking care of the spiritual world, contributing to our families, our schools, our communities, our nation and the world. Uh, and one way is of, through practice for the land and the environment and taking care of the land and the environment. In our case, it's also striving towards food island sustainability, particularly when it comes to food sovereignty, um, but also self-determination and contributing to world peace. And because of the loss of our language and culture over the last, you know, 200 years, also revitalizing and normalizing again our language and our culture. And these are all innate responsibilities that we have to overtly teach rather than just figuring that the students will get it somewhere along the way. And so the first building, as I mentioned, that we built on our campus, going from shipping containers and tents and being in the environment uh, because we had no, no place other than to go, um, was is this place called Kauhale Oivi Opukapu. Um, and it became the first 
platinum lead certified educational building in all of Hawaii. Before that rich private school that President Obama uh, graduated from got into green technology, we already built a building that was LEED Platinum certified. I wouldn't do that again because I really am over other people validating what our people already knew. But it was important to show ancient is modern because the reason we got the LEED was because our students went to the elders and they asked the elders, what do you want? And the elders told us, we want this place to look Hawaiian. We want it to look like Waimea, the place it's located. And we want it to take care of the environment. So all of those rocks that have been, that you see around these rock walls, they were all gathered up in the mountains with protocol, asking the rocks if they wanted to come. And when they didn't, we left it there. The rocks that felt, all, you know, sometimes you pick up a rock and it really doesn't want to go. You leave it there. We picked up another one. We asked each rock, do you want to come with us and be part of our school? The students did those kind of things. They were the ones who said, we need to make sure that our water is recycled. We need to make sure that we are energy sufficient, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so they were involved in the building. And, and I don't know if you saw earlier, we had those young guys with a construction hat. They were part of all of that uh, revegetate or vegetating, uh, creating the vegetation for the building, et cetera. And then we said, okay, what else can we do? And so the kindergarten teacher came and said, I want to do a waste audit. This was like in 2000 and I forget, nine or something. I had never heard of a waste audit before. So I told her, oh, sure, because I didn't know what it was. So her kindergartners did a waste audit. And what they found out, that the two things that we were wasting on campus, you know, we, we it was milk because it wasn't really milk. It was this 1% watery stuff that they give our children to, 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 to drink as part of their food, as their lunch, lunch. And they didn't like it. So a lot of the milk just went into buckets. Some of it we gave to pigs, but there was just a lot of milk wasted. And so then a senior took it on as her senior project to find out what we could use milk for and find out that the early Egyptians, you know, used a milk-based paint and that already, and that that kind of milk-based paint was used all the way until the discovery of latex. And so we created this milk-based paint that has no smell. We used native dyes to then dye it and we painted the inside of our building with this milk-based paint. As I mentioned, uh, paper was obviously another thing that we had a lot of wasted, you know, people, they write on it, they throw it away. Uh, what are we going to do with it? So we created paper Crete stepping stones. So this is like concrete, except it's made out of paper. And these stepping stones went in between our gardens because where, where the school is, it's very wet. And so you don't have to step into the mud. You can step onto these stepping stones. And it was a project that the entire school was involved in. Our students also created a living machine to recycle our wastewater and try to figure out what algae grow best and all those kind of things. So directly involved in sustainability at the school level, but that would give them skills that they could use at home, like recycling, for example, or also, um, you know, in, in the real world of work. Another thing was, as I mentioned, food sovereignty, high priority for us. So learning how to catch food, how to grow food, how to gather food, another very, very high priority. And taking care of the land. Yeah, that, that, was, uh, that is part of our responsibility. The kids understanding that they have a responsibility to the land and to take care of the land. We also felt that they needed to figure out uh, have a responsibility of figuring out what they were going to be. And so we provided them with lots of opportunities to explore various careers that would allow them to stay in Hawaii. Um, in 2011, 45% of all Hawaiians lived uh, on the continent. In 2021, 10 years later, 55% of all Hawaiians live on the continent. If we keep on going another 20, 30 years at the rate of accelerated exodus and out migration because we can't afford to live in Hawaii, by in 20 years, we will have less than 25% of our people living in our own land 
because we can't find jobs that pay enough money so we can survive in our homeland. So we have a huge, huge issue with being economic refugees in the continental US because we can't afford to live in Hawaii. So finding careers that would pay enough for our young people to live in Hawaii has been something that's really, really important and our students to understand that they have a responsibility to find jobs and to enter careers that will allow them to stay in Hawaii rather than um, things that the, the only place that they can make enough money is on the US continent or elsewhere. And so that was another high thing. And then the other um, responsibility was to their communities and to their community activism. So really uh, solving social, economic and environmental problems in their communities, preventing further destruction of the environment and their way of life and revitalizing traditional knowledge and practices. So I've so showed you lots of pictures of our valley, Waipio Valley, and it is a sacred place. It is known as, in traditional times, it was known as the Valley of the Kings and, and um, a place where the elite of Hawaii Island uh, would meet and would live sometimes. There were over 10,000 people that lived in this small valley that now has like a permanent residence, maybe 50 people. And when you go to the lookout, which is as far as we want anybody to come, um, you, you, you look down, but you had no idea what you were looking at. You didn't know anything about the history of the valley, whether you are a visitor from anywhere around the world, because it is the second most visited lookout and spot on our island, the first being the volcano. They, they didn't know that tourists didn't know what they're looking at, and our own people didn't know what they were looking at either. So our school decided, uh, one of our projects, uh, middle school, high school project, decided to create a signage, five signs that would explain about YPO. And if you can see, these are bilingual, bilingual signs with Hawaiian being the first language and English the second language, and explaining that this is a sacred place. And if you have no function in this place, don't go down. We don't... We, there is no place for you to go. There's only the road. Once you leave the road, you're trespassing. Um, you're causing, because the road is the steepest road in all of the US, you're causing lots of problems for the farmers that have to go up and down. And frankly, again, you have no function. You have no responsibility, no use. Um, the valley has no use for you. And you're just taking, you're not giving anything back, which is not our way of life. And so these signs were done in 2003. They got super weathered, but we are happy to say that just last week they installed the, the re, a remake of these signs so that now people can read them again. And this is something now um, people are, like the, our graduates are bringing their children to this place, right? And they're saying, look, daddy worked on this or mommy worked on this. We did this. I, I found this picture. Uh, I, I wrote this sentence or I translated this thing. And then there's this pride, right, in, in their community and in the things that they have done long after they graduated. Our students also get involved in service learning in terms of um, helping the community wherever they can. Um, you know, lots of hands can do a lot of things. And <clears throat> so it's really our responsibility is to grow cultural practitioners that are ready, willing, and able to continue the practices of our ancestors into the future, which were disrupted for, you know, quite a while. I want to say almost 200 years. All right, one more time. You can do it sitting or standing up. Let's go uh, to the right first. Kahilua koluha left. Kahilua koluha right. Kahilua koluha left. Kahilua koluha, right? Kahilua koluha. And one more time. Kahilua koluha. Now shoulders up and down. First down. Kahilua koluha. And up. Kahilua koluha. 
tan kahilu akoluha a kahilu akoluha tan kahilu akoluha a kahilu akoluha tan kahilu akoluha one more time up kahilu akoluha all right let's shake a little bit and then the last one is head up and down first down kahilu akoluha up Kahilua koluha down. Kahilua koluha. Kahilua koluha down again. Kahilua koluha up. Kahilua koluha. One more time. Kahilua koluha. And kahilua koluha. And last one, turn to your right. Kahilua koluha. Turn to your left. Kahilua koluha. To the right. Kahilua koluha, kahilua koluha, and the right again. Kahilua koluha, left. Kahilua koluha, kahilua koluha, and left. Kahilua koluha. All right, and shake it out, shake it out. Um, so what we do is when we do these exercises, we do them entirely in Hawaiian. And our students are not raised as Hawaiian language speakers. So this is one way um, uh, that is called total physical response or TPR that we're teaching the language. Um, so now let's get to the rigor. Okay, so we, we've done the relations, we've done the relevance, we've figured out the responsibility. So what is the outcome? The rigor is not just academic and global competence, but also cultural and Hawaiian competence and what I call social and personal competence. All of those things, we want to get to a high level uh, of rigor when it comes to that. Our kupuna said, Kulia ika nuu ika pai pai kapu uliloa. Strive to reach the summit, the highest, plat the sacred platform of Liloa. So our, our quest to strive for excellence is ancient. This is a standard that was set by our ancestors. It's not an or maybe, maybe not, it, it, it's a mandate. Strive to do our best is a mandate. And so we strive to reach, um, to, to reach our highest level with everything that we do. And so that now um, is validated by our assessment practices. In Hawaiian, we call the demonstration of knowledge uh, ho ike ho, meaning to call something ike, meaning knowledge, so we're causing our ike to be demonstrated. And that kind of uh, assessment is a performance-based assessment to an authentic audience, many times multi-sensory, impactful, meaning it, it's doing something to that audience, and a lot of times personalized, where the, the thing, not everybody's taking the same test. So if you look at that, each person here, you know, some are holding, she's dancing or chanting. They all have different uh, responsibilities based on their interests and their strengths. And so it's about allowing our learners to show what they know and what they can do versus written tests, particularly standardized tests that really just show what the students don't know and can do. And as they're being assessed, they are really through that assessment educating others, whether it's their peers, their parents, the staff or the community, and they are learning also while they're being assessed. Eho ike mai ana kalaao akikia manu means um, we will know how successful one is by what he produces. In traditional times, you would know if a bird catcher was successful by counting the, the birds on his gum stick. And so it's really about the, the students demonstrating what they have learned. And so they're in front of authentic audience, which could be peers, family members, community members, community organizations, county or state boards or commissions. Our students have uh, testified in front of the legislature and into funders. And by the way, you see this guy down on the bottom, it, behind him is this yellow wall. So this is milk-based paint colored with turmeric. And again, when we first painted this 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 uh, this room, no smells whatsoever. The students could be in there that day actually uh, because there was no toxic nothing. Um, and so these multi -de sensory demonstrations of knowledge include oral, multimedia, kinesthetics, 
like dancing, song, singing, acting, designing, or building, or visual or more functional ways like drawing, sculpting, weaving, plating, sewing. That's how they get assessed, not through written papers. Our uh, Kupuna also said, Hana Miki Oi Lave Auli, you work on things until they're excellent, until they're exquisite. So a very high standard as they complete their work. And then they show them off through projects and performances that are purposeful and useful and show, as I mentioned, what the students know. And so every year we're getting ready for that. This week, it's going to happen next week. We have an annual hula drama or a dance drama where our students from pre preschool through 12th grade perform one time for their peers and other school groups, one time for the parents and the extended family, and one time for the community. And the students write and narrow the script and the narrate, sorry, the script and the program. They create and perform the chants and the dances. They create their own attire. So this is all sewn by the students, dyed by the students. Uh, they run the lights, the audio. They create the ads and the PSAs on the radio and all everything that has to do with this. It's an authentic assessment of many different skills. Aukupuna said, Aai kahula, vaiho kahila hile kahale. When one wants to dance the hula, bashfulness should be left at home. So this idea of uh, extemporary, extemporary speaking and being in front of audiences and being comfortable in front of audiences as they exhibit um, you know, the things that they have learned is a really, really important skill that they need throughout their lives. And so here you see, you know, from the very young children um, all the way to the to the older ones. We also do lots of presentations to authentic audiences because when um, they have an authentic audience, they can see why they're doing this, right? And according to Etutopia, you know, it helps the students connect to the work in the classroom, to the real world, and a sense of buy-in for students and attention to their work. Um, I usually don't, as I said, I'm, I'm not too much into va having others valid us anymore, but I just wanted to show ancient is modern again. Lots of authentic uh, community presentations about um, issues in the community, whether it is uh, invasive species, or whether it is about you know other things, also presenting to their peers, um, and then allowing them to become not just consumers of education, but creators of information and knowledge that is their information and ancestral knowledge. So our students create greeting cards. So this is all I'm going to show you now. I'm going to go through it relatively quickly. It's all student produced work that speaks to the rigor of their learning, the ed, that their their quest for excellence, right? This is these are and these are between preschool and high school uh, posters that they that they drew, and our kids are incredible artists. And then many of these things are used as entrepreneurial projects as well. Calendars that they create, you know, in this case they use Photoshop or something, you know, and what. Uh, so that sometimes it's technology, sometimes it's just art. Like creating games. This is like a go fish game where they have to, uh, this is cherish one another. So they have to find the four cards that said, you know, cherish one another. Another one would be love one another. Another one would be take care of one another and whatnot. And so they're learning Hawaiian language while they're playing games and they are creating the games. We're not creating games, they are creating games. Our students are also the first students in Hawaii who have been published authors of hardcover books. And here is uh, two authors and their books. And then we have a, had like a fireside chat where, where the, the books were read to the community and the books were also read to, to other students. So this is still ongoing. These, and then uh, some of, we've also, the students have also created coloring books, um, again, to take care of the environment. And those are actually on our Ecoversities website on the e regular Ecoversities network website, and you can download them for free. <coughs> we are they're also involved in in multimedia projects, anti vaping campaigns, anti smoking campaigns. Because unfortunately, Hawaiian teenage girls are the highest group of smokers, and um. In when COVID was around, they created uh, things about COVID safety rules. 
uh, recycling tips, talking about historic figures or important dates in Hawaiian history. And they do that through videos and TikToks and websites. Here they're teaching using TikTok uh, to teach younger students, parents, community members, and the general public um, how to speak Hawaiian with your dog, you know, so fetch, go here, you know, sit down, whatever, whatever kind of things, listen to me. And so these are all impactful exhibitions of knowledge that educate others, that affect positive change, that make a difference. And so for us, we don't believe in any assignment or test that I look at as a teacher and then throw away. That just doesn't make any sense to us. All right, how are we doing? Thumbs up, thumbs down, we're almost there. Thank you for being with us, continuing to be with us. Are we still okay? All right. So now we get to the last final part, having fun, right? So humor all the time, joyful atmosphere, lots of laughter. That was our biggest criticism when we were a school within a school. They claimed the students weren't learning. And I said, why would you say that? And this was my own colleagues telling me that. I said, why would you say that? They said, oh, every time we go by your classroom, you're laughing. So our problem was we were laughing too much, you know, and I'm going like, heck, if this is Western education, I really, I'm out, I'm out. I don't, you know, I, I want to laugh. I want to have fun. I want to say, say jokes. I want to engage in fun activities, in games and physical movement um, because it is so important. Albert Einstein says play is the highest form of research. And I tend to agree with him on that. And so while they're engaging in real world science, remember this is, these are the girls from that YPO uh, water study project. They're having lots of fun also. Um, while they're performing for their families in the community, they're having lots of fun from baby on, right? For, for a baby and little kids to be on a stage and feel comfortable. I mean, that's something that you can never take away from them. Um, in later life. You know, you have adults that go onto a stage and would rather die right, because they're so uncomfortable being in front of an audience. Our kids have no problem because they're on there from baby on, literally. Um, listening to the elders tell stories, always, always fun. Hand puppets. These are hand puppets that the students created with different stories. Always, always fun. Competition, right? Our kids love competition, whether it's group competition or individual competition, lots of fun competing against one another. Preparing and eating healthy and nutritious food. Again, lots of fun and they do that a lot. Playing with their peers in different places, you know, lots and lots of fun there. Having fun learning in and from the environment. Um, and just having fun learning period, right? That idea that learning should be fun, that there's no reason why it should not be fun and making sure that it is because things just stick better when you enjoyed learning them rather than you just had to learn them because you were gonna get a grade or a test and la, 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 la. All right. So in the chat, could you please share you, what do you think was your most valuable takeaway from today's um, presentation? What you, just one sentence um, of you, the most valuable um, takeaway from this experience, from this presentation today. Most valuable experience, and whatever that means to you is up to you. All right. I, Nice stuff, thank you for sharing. Rigor, okay, and the formula, responsibility, great. Excellent. Yeah, so just you can still keep on writing um, anything that you thought was important. And so um, in order, our this is one of my mentors. He, she just passed away two years ago and I dearly, dearly miss him. But he really um, felt very strongly that in order for our next generation, and it's not just one, but generations to live, learn and thrive and have healthy, productive lives, we have to start by living and by teaching with aloha. And um, I have found in the last 35 years that I have been in this business, um, and again, it's to me, it's not a business, it, it is a 
privilege, right, to teach um, and and to learn at the same time. Um, I think that's uh, that is something that I cherish very, very much, and I will continue to try my best to live and teach with Aloha. It's a daily thing, right? Because we all get upset, we all get uh, over overwhelmed, we all la, la, la. and so we have to make this a really a conscious, uh, explicit commitment. And so what we have found out, our 35 years of research, according to my husband, clearly show that the way of our the way our ancestors taught is still the most effective way that we can teach Hawaiians today. And that's also validated by you know other research organizations. Kamehameha Schools is a very rich private school for Hawaiians, and they do lots of research. And one of their studies is called Hawaiian Culture Influences in Education. And it's saying you know that culture-based educational strategies are a promising means of addressing the education disparities. And not just between Hawaiian students, but all indigenous students, and their peers, because we have clear educational disparities among indigenous and minority students and marginalized students and our and their peers. When our second king, Kamehameha II, went to England in 1824, they expected a savage. Uh, prior to that, the missionary that came in 1820 said, can they be human? Are they not perhaps a link between man and the brute? So four years earlier, we had been described by this missionary as the missing link, you know, half animal, half human, whatever. And then our King Liho Liho comes to England. And as you can see, he's perfectly dressed, perfect hair, perfect eyebrows, perfect clothes, right? I mean, for its time, this was, you couldn't get, look any better, right, in, in, in 1824 England. And they're going, how can that be? We expected, you know, a savage, maybe noble, but still savage. And here you are, you can speak English, you, you can use forks and spoons and knives and whatever, and you, you carry yourself with this air of, you know, not superiority, but of, of confidence. And he goes, duh, na vai ho i ka ole o kamai. Who wouldn't be wise on a path walked by my parents and ancestors, right? Hello, um, I'm, I am who I am because of my ancestors, my parents and my ancestors. And I feel confident that this is my, the right path because obviously here I am, you know, in a totally different place. And I'm functioning just fine, right? I, I am. Uh, you're complimenting me, complimenting me on who I am, and that is only because I am walking on the path walked by my parents and ancestors. And so, my message, my final message to you folks, is that like Leo Leo, we should value our traditional ways, no matter where you come from. Because I told you all of this about Hawaii, but I, I would say that everybody um, that is in this room. If you, if if I asked you to share this, like of of your ancestors, you would come up with very, very similar accomplishments and achievements and wisdom and values and understanding. And so we should value our traditional ways, including our native ways of learning, and understand that for Hawaiians. But I really would like to say for all Indigenous peoples and for all peoples that are close um, to the land still yet and understand their relationship to those who went before them ancient is modern. And so um, I thank you for your presentation. I would like to really quick, I, there's a QR code here and I want to also get it, um, get you the, give me one second here. I will also put it into the chat because uh, for us, it's really important that, there we go. All right, now let me go back to here uh, and tell, all right. So you have it uh, as a QR code and you also have it in the chat. It's a short survey, but I would really appreciate if, if you could just fill it out. It'll take like a two minutes, I think at the very most. Um, and then because we opened 
with um, traditional protocol, we also have to close with with um, with traditional protocol. And there was a question in the chat, a lady left already, but I still want to answer the question that said, how come I uh, greet it? Because what this is now, it's the exact opposite. So when I greet it, everybody has started with the deities, with the highest power, and I went to the least significant one. As I'm saying my thank you and showing my gratitude, I'm starting with the least significant one um, and then going all the way up to the highest power. But she asked why I greet it, or in this case now I'm expressing my gratitude to the leaders around the world. There should just be one around there, sorry. Um, and that is <clears throat> because that's you. You are the leaders, right? <laughs> uh, and I'm grateful for you because we need you, right? We need leaders. If everybody just sat home and waited for the world to turn, you know, it, that's not that's not going to happen, right? So the the people I greeted and the people that I'm expressing my gratitude to are the leaders that are trying to make a difference to the world. So obviously, Mr. Trump was not included in this. <laughs> Neither the aloha nor the mahalo part, you know. Um, because it has to be somebody, when I when I talk about a leader, I'm talking about a positive leader, a, a leader who made a positive difference, kind of. That to me is a leader. The other guy is an a-hole as far as I'm concerned. They, I don't consider them leaders. You know, that's not, that's not the kind of, it, that's just my interpretation. So I would like to say mahalo, which means thank you in Hawaiian and express my gratitude. Mahalo e mahalo e kalehule, mahalo e na makua, mahalo e na kuna, mahalo e na diu, mahalo e na makua, mahalo e na kuwa, mahalo. Mahalo Nui. Um, again, my name is Etiku, and if you would like to um, um, get in touch with me for whatever reason, my email is ku at kuakanaka.com. Um, this www.kuakanaka.com is our social enterprise. But if you're interested more about the school, you can also email me and I can send you the website for the school, see what they're doing now. They're in their 23rd year. We started in 2000. My husband still teaches there. Um, and my daughter went up yesterday to help with sewing attire for the hula drama. So we're still very much involved, um, you know, as a family um, in the school. Um, but yes, please feel free to contact me anytime. Um, Andrea, is there going to be any opportunities to share the PowerPoint with you folks and then you put it somewhere in case somebody wants it? Yes, cool. We can send it. We will have all the recordings and all the information okay. after the conference for everyone. So you can send it to us okay. and we we'll put it on the folder to share it. Yeah. So it's probably better if you see, if you watch the, uh, the, the recording. And... Then before I go, let me see if there's anybody else who has a question. You can put it into the chat. We have like four minutes. I'm half German. <laughs> and, and Germans are super anal when it comes to time. So I really ever, don't ever try to go up <laughs> over time. But um, if there is a question, um, I would be happy um, to answer it. And yeah, if you could please fill out the, um, the evaluation or reflection form that I put into the chat. And then I also had the kind the QR code earlier. Um, anybody, anything? And then let me stop sharing this. Okay, we can see each other here. All right. If not, then again, I wish you a wonderful day or night. For most of you, it's, it's only 10 o'clock, 10.30 here. But I know for many of you, it, it's much, much, much later. Uh, so Albert, nah, just joking. <laughs> he, I can understand if you're tired. Um, but, um, um, it, we are, I'm only two hours oh. later than yours. 
Oh, not too bad, then. Yeah. I'm in California. Oh, okay, okay. Oh, don't worry. Lorena no, wanted to. Lorena has her hand uh, raised, maybe. Yeah, thank you. I always have questions. <laughs> um, first, just deep gratitude um, for all that you've shared. It was just, it's inspiring. It's just really, really beautiful work. And uh, I'm just grateful for all you've done um, for your own people, but also then sharing that wisdom with us. Um, I wish for all of us to reclaim our ancestral knowledge and um, bring sanity back to the world. Yeah. Um, my question is, um, uh, you know, in the WhatsApp thread that uh, Eco um, Universities has, um, I've been seeing there's a, a long thread on unschooling. What is this unschooling and unschooling versus um, traditional Western um, education? And um, I feel like you've you've to me, what I've seen, like a beautiful marrying of kind of maybe not even the two, just bringing back your ancestral wisdom in a, in a structured way that students are able to really um, to learn in a supported environment and to use those skills to uh, maybe work and things like that. But um, I guess I'm wondering what your thoughts are as far as you know, you know, the unschooling maybe movement or, you know, thinking that people are bringing... I think we're just looking for alternatives to um, to colonized, more mm -hmm. colonization, right? More, um, what is the word I'm looking for? More indoctrination. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. so first of all, is that we call whatever we're doing preferred education. So it's what we prefer, right? It's not the, the alternative. When we say alternative, it always has a less than ring. To it you know uh we we had uh, prior to us starting our programs and calling it academically rigorous everything that was hawaiian was considered remedial right so um and and that was alternative the alternative was the remedial and so we say okay our preferred way of education that's basically you know how we look at it um is to me it would be all in the environment and just learning from experts and teachers and all that but I don't know that that is lo logistically possible, right? Kind of thing, you know, we, we have to look at large groups. If we look at all of our students, you know, um, Hawaiian students, I mean, we're talking hundreds of thousands of students, right? Kind of thing. Um, and will we have the, the environment and or the experts to teach them in that way, right? Is that logistically possible? So in those cases, then having something that you call a school it might not look like a, a Western school, but that, that's the only word, you know, I mean, that we would use um, is probably something that we, we still need. Because in our case, you know, our parents, um, just the, the way the economics are, don't have enough time or the grandparents um, don't have enough knowledge because we were, we were, um, extricated or, or separated from that knowledge, right? So it, hundred. 200 years ago, our elders would have been able to teach everything that we needed to know. But the current generation of elders were completely colonized. They don't know their language. They don't know their culture. They eat spam and hot dogs and, you know, uh, canned food, be pretty much and rice. You know, they don't, they don't follow no Navy diet, none of the. So that would have been in the unschooling model where we send our children to is the, is the grandparents. So my grandpa, my grandchildren are fortunate because when they come to me, and I not, not, don't want to sound braggy or anything, but I can share, right, the, the traditional stuff. But but I would say 90 plus percent of their peers don't have that. They, they will go to a grandparent that really does not know any of those things. So in the absence of having that as a as a family thing where we could do unschooling, I think we need, we need to keep this schooling part at least for a while until we grow the generation where the elders are again knowledgeable about all these things so i would say maybe two three generations down the road i can see us going back to family education right which is kind of unschooling to me is more family community education but we have to grow our families and communities around that knowledge first 
before we can get them there. Now, maybe that's very different in other countries, you know, where there is still the language that the elders still speak the language and they still practice the tradition. Then I would push for the unschooling. Thank you so much. That's that makes so much sense. Yeah, brilliantly said. Thank you. And then I also, before I forget, I want to mahalo. I want to thank our translators, uh, Albert and Joao and Nariman, um, for helping with the translations. Thank you so much for that. I really appreciate it. And Andrea, obviously, and, and uh, Sarah was there too. Our facilitators or whatever you folks are called. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I want to also make sure I thank you folks. Um, yeah. Um, today I was, I don't know if that's um, luck because I didn't um, facilitate translating. Um, I have wondered. Um, I'm a mar marine scientist by training. And what what I found in my university is that this sacred relationship to the land it was missing. Yeah. Um, and or indigenous communities they used to migrate to the sea, stationally, seasonally, um, by the seasons. But due to colonization, that migration has been severed, and they only reside in in the mountains. And even then, their indigenous knowledge it has a protocol, and I cannot go with them. And you know, um, I'm I miss this. So I don't have that um, intimacy. So I was, I wonder, um, what do you think, how do you feel about our relationship with the ocean? Um, I know that in Hawaii, due to um, the military occupation of the U.S., um, there is a privatization of, of the sea. Um, and that also we experience here in the U.S., Mexico border. So I wonder, um, I don't know if this is the right question of if I'm being, being clear of how do you feel about that relationship? Um, what has the ocean, what have you observed that the ocean wants for us as human people? Um, heavy question, I don't know <laughs> your yeah. thoughts. Well, again, um, we have uh, many cosmogonic genealogies, but our, you know, we, we, we understand that the la that the life came out of the ocean, came out of that dark of the ocean. That's our, one of our stories talks about those things. And we, the ocean is part of our, uh, it's a body form of our deities, right? So, so it's a sacred ocean. And the pollution that's been happening to the ocean is very, very scary for us because the runoff from the golf courses and all that kind of things uh, uh, has already polluted certain areas where we can't eat the fish anymore, you know, and things like that. So we are our our students and, and we as people, our communities are involved in keeping the ocean as clean as possible. Now we have also with the global warming, the rise of the ocean. So some of our places, they predict by 2050, uh, cities that are going to be underwater, you know. So now the ocean is becoming a threat, not because we, uh, Hawaiian, Hawaiian people, <laughs> caused the damage, but the, the damage was caused on a global level and we are impacted by it. So um, we have a sacred relationship with the ocean. Um, I I feel the, the most the happiest <laughs> when I am in the ocean. I, my birthday was on Sunday. Uh, and I spent three hours swimming from 6.45 in the morning <laughs> until 10 o'clock. And I was, you know, I haven't been that happy in a very long time. So um, we do have a very, very close relationship and our babies go into the ocean at a very, very young age already. Um, and 
we we will just have to try our best to mitigate the damage that has already been done and help to prevent further damage. I don't know if that directly answers it, but we look at the ocean as a sacred entity, just like the land. Don't yeah, it is it is a similar answer to this book by Karin Amimoto Ingersoll about that we have to become the ocean, um, like the waves encountering each other and doing this superposition, um, not um, in an uh, invading, uh, negating sense, but as a collaboration. Who here is Anna? Uh, they are. Uh, she's the one holding the next space. So, yeah. so, thank you very much, everybody. I wish you again a, a wonderful rest of the day, night, and a great weekend. And until we meet again, we say in Hawaiian aloha. Aloha. <laughs> bye bye. Aloha. Thank you so much. Bye.